way for us to launch our uh, conversations uh, around practice. Um, and um, this sits within the Center for Arts and Memory and Communities. My name is Carolina Gitu, and I'm joined here by John Devane, Antelina Lavera, and Gilles Journeau, all part of CAMSI uh, Center for Arts, Memory and Communities, and also part of the Critical Practices Strand. And the Critical Practices Strand is a strand within the center that is looking at and exploring practice research, uh, the capacity of practice to generate new knowledge, to advance uh, research questions, and also to intervene in society. Um, so this is a, a conversation that I guess will also help us inform what's happening in the center and also disseminate what's happening in the center and within our practices. So really to, to start uh, the conversation, I would like to um, um, I would like to ask you, uh, because we all come from different ways of practicing. So myself as, as a practicing curator, practicing in, say, the expanded field of exhibition making, John Devane and, and Gilles Journeau working with painting and drawing and making. And, and then we have Anthony Laveria, who is uh, working mainly with photography, but also in a very participatory and collaborative um, uh, practice and, and delving into society societal issues. So we all kind of have different different entry points to this notion of practice. So I guess my first question would be uh, for us to um, to articulate a bit what are the key components uh, for our practice? What are those things that for us kind of constitute the way we uh, develop and articulate practice? Um, John, do you want to uh, make a start? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I suppose the way I see my practice is, um, is to do with the origination of artifacts and objects, which happen to be, for the most part, paintings, but they can be drawings or photographs. Sorry. Um, and it's an ongoing practice that really is, is rooted in a study, an ongoing study of uh, depiction and representation, particularly around the figure uh, depiction of the human be the human face, physiognomy, etc. Um, and it's 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 largely private in the sense that it, the subject matter, I guess, is autobiographical, uh, largely domestic, uh, my own life, my own situation, etc. Um, it's it's not collaborative, <laughs> to be frank, in, in the sense that I only collaborate really when I'm showing the work. And of course, that's a key part of, I think, being an artist in some sense of having some output. So at the current time, things have changed, uh, but my practice is becoming a little more reflective, I think, since this lockdown business. Um, I feel I'm spending more time looking at things that I perhaps didn't. I was in too much of a hurry in the past, I think. And I think this is it's, it's a slight shift of emphasis. So I'm not quite sure. I'm defining it very well, but I, I just get the sense I'm sort of um, thinking slightly longer term <laughs> um, and slower, so sort of slow down a bit. So I'm, I'm trying to review and uh, reflect a little more, perhaps, whereas I, my, my inclination is, is to produce and to keep on churning out stuff. And, you know, there can be quality issues there if you if one is doing that all the time. So. Is that enough to, to start, with, Carolina? Yeah. Yes, that's that's really good. We'll come, we'll get back to that to the to the the ways in which practice has also has been challenged and and also changed with with the current uh, conditions. But for the time being, it's it's great. Thank you, John. Um, Jill, do you want to um, to follow up on on this? Yes, I'll have a go. Um, I think my work has always been autobiographical. It's domestic, it's domestic in scale and always has been, with the very rare exception where I made something big for a sort of a bigger gallery, public gallery space. It's mainly collected in domestic collections. Um, it's content and often the process has been domestic. So the content has often been um, about interiors or things, objects from within interiors. 
but more recently has included elements of a particular landscape, which is where I have my studio in Portugal. It's a slow practice anyway, but I've been pretty slow in terms of making things that are very time intensive for at least 25 years now. That seemed utterly ridiculous when I was working in a management role, but it was a, a kind of, you know, alternative in terms of speed and being. Um, and now tend to work quite slowly. The piece behind me on the wall has taken two years. That's not unusual for a stitched piece on that scale for me. I do make other things that are quicker as well, but it, actually this lockdown, whilst initially I felt I didn't want to work because it felt so odd, um, I played with things, but you know, I've actually found I'm being pretty creative. I'm not happy about it, but it's the best thing to do in the situation. So that I've become very bored. We're back in lockdown in less than now. And so there is no alternative but to simply go in the room that I write and draw and stitch in um, for most of the day. There is nothing else that will engage me. So it's kind of probably working for me, but I have no intention of particularly changing my practice because I think practice is mature. They have very deep roots and I've often found the use of going back into my own practice and refinding things that I hadn't come to conclusions about or things that I tinted at and bringing them out again. And that kind of richness of ingredients is, is something that comes with a more mature practice. And I think that you don't just sort of knock that off course because of external events. I'm more likely to shift my practice due to internal personal events. They've been the big shifting factors. Thank you, Jill. Anthony? My practice is often described as uh, socially yeah. engaged, uh, uh, <laughs> collaborative, uh, participatory, or otherwise sort of involved in uh, facilitating the co-creation of uh, images and other artefacts. Um, often I work with people, uh, individuals or groups of people that are overly spoken for, uh, or often marginalised in uh, public or mainstream conversation. And one of the sort of larger threads of my practice over the last 18 years has been working with people who have experienced homelessness in towns and cities around the UK. Um, but I've also worked with other groups of people and individuals that are described in ways such as children from lower socioeconomic households, people with addiction issues, uh, people who identify as queer, Ultimately, the, uh, at the crux of what I do is, is the relationships that I develop with, with the people that I work with. And uh, f for me, uh, those relationships are absolutely key. Um, I mean, this particular moment, which I'm sure we'll talk more about, um, when it first sort of came about uh, towards the end of, of March, uh, really kind of uh, it was a bit of a curveball for me because I had to really sort of really reflect on how as a socially engaged artist how could I carry on making work in a time of social distancing and uh, and I seem to have uh, I feel like I've managed to kind of wade through that a bit with a bit more clarity than I perhaps had at the very beginning of this period uh, but yeah that's that's in a nutshell how, how I would generally describe my practice as something that is um, that is is co-created uh, and the practice itself I often describe as being a platform uh, with which I like to try and find ways to amplify or uh, platform or or share the opportunities that I'm able to access and organize to uh, enable the people I work with to speak out about the things they're interested in and the sort of uh, systems and services that shape their lives. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Um, it's interesting, like the, the I mean, definitely the, the your practices uh, being so diverse, they also speak to, I think, the richness of the center and how they bring very different skills and different, very different entry points to the notion of practice. Uh, in terms of uh, what you just said, Anthony, I was just thinking about this kind of ongoing debate, uh, whether we should be using social distancing or physical distancing, because in a way we can also claim that what we are doing here although in a different set of conditions we are also socializing although you know keeping physical distance but socializing 
uh, be it like through these these platforms, these interfaces, or even when we uh, hang out outside, keeping the one meter plus um, distance or the two meters before. Um, so so it's, it will be interesting also to then, uh, I think, reflect on that in terms of your particular practice, I guess. In, in terms of, of, of what brings me to practice uh, very quickly before we move on to to the next question is um, so I am myself a practicing curator and um, and what I've been developing um, is uh, what I would call curating in the expanded field of exhibition making, uh, meaning that I really don't uh, uh, produce exhibitions. It's not a medium I use particularly, but I do get a lot of inspiration uh, from the ways in which curating articulates artifacts and and I would say also ideas. Years. So the very uh, proposition of having in in a room um, the the possibility of articulating, of juxtaposing objects, um, artifacts, uh, etc., materials that probably have never seen before, have never um, shared the same space uh, before. And so if we do kind of transpose that idea to the realm of ideas, of concepts, of arguments, we we do generate a very rich uh, arena and uh, also I think the capacity to inquire, to ask questions and to address urgencies um, um, that usually are difficult to tackle if you don't take uh, other steps. And I'm thinking about contested histories, for instance, and my work is particularly looking at um, a major event in Portugal, the, the revolution in 74, and thinking of how um, the, the liberation movements in Africa were absolutely crucial for that event, and they keep being dismissed as part of the official narrative around the, this major event. So how to get that history into contact with uh, the history of the liberation movement in contact with, uh, uh, with this major uh, revolution. Um, this is something that I've been working on through curatorial means. So usually what I do use is mainly dialogical formats, say talks, uh, conferences, but also time-based formats, um, screenings, performances, etc., and 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 try to articulate the different ideas that colleagues is necessarily participatory as well and and collaborative. So how colleagues bring their own thoughts and their own um, insights to generate a debate uh, within that arena of programming. Um, so so as I was saying, I think would be. Uh, uh, Great also to to take some time in this conversation for us to look at how uh, what we are going through. So say COVID-19 and all the restrictions that came with it, how um, how these informed or how shaped or how it made us think of practice differently or relate to practice differently. And we had already some comments from John, uh, Jill and, and Anthony uh, from different angles. I'm very interested in what Jill said about the domestic. Um, that's uh, when as soon as the lockdown started, you felt you didn't want to practice, whereas we would expect because you were uh, at, in your home, you had to stay at home um, and we would expect that you were more productive. I think I, it's very interesting that relationship, I guess, um, between those two moments, those two gestures. Um, so, so if we could have just some thoughts of how we are currently dealing with practice from, from the physical social distancing uh, for Anthony, the domestic not being the welcome space for the domestic work or uh, work domestic practice or uh, John and also feeling that things are slowing down and, and in a way his practice is changing. Uh, we the, the mics are muted, so whoever yeah. wants to, yeah, John. Yeah, I think that, I think for me it's been quite a productive time in, in the same, in but it's a kind of contradictory situation in some ways, I feel, so that most people that I know that are artists have been quite productive because they feel it's business as usual to some degree. But then you've got this thing of this enforced seclusion. So it's one thing being able to stay in when you choose. It's quite another to be told you've got to stay in. And I think that it, it's made me look at things. Um, I mean, following on from Jill's actually, I mean, Jill, I mean, I, my my work, I tend to have a thematic interest in film, photography, the relationship of those things. 
However, in the, since the lockdown, my interest has been a little more towards objects as well as people around me, um, more so than looking at film as a form of escape, I suppose. I don't quite know why that's happened, but I'm less interested in many of the things I was interested in prior to this starting. But I don't think things look a lot different. It's as though it's, it's, it's my, my head, really. I think that the um, sort of change is taking shape, but the practice is still, I mean, I suppose, as Jill was saying about it, it, that thing of having um, some level of maturity of practice, you, it, I still feel a kind of momentum to keep the whole thing going, which I think wouldn't stop anyway. It would, I've always done it. It will carry on. Um, but I guess it's those ideas that impinge on your thinking as you're pursuing this 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 sort of route. I mean, part of me, it's a sort of existential thing, I think. I, I, I do tend to think of it as a slightly few, more futile thing than it was a few months ago. Um, I think partly because it is so private, you know, uh, and maybe that's a sort of guilt thing. I don't know. I don't quite know how to deal with that, but it, it's, it, it, I don't think it does anybody any good, really. You know, it's sort of something I do, but it, it's, um, it's maybe reflect, I guess, on, on why I do it anyway in, in the first place. Um, uh, and, and I think one always does that, you know, throughout your career, you, you reflect on what on earth you're doing and why. But I guess, I guess these circumstances and, family dynamics and closeness with other, you know, it's made me rethink a few things. Having said that, I'll still be doing this in a few weeks time and a few months time and probably a few years time. So is that okay? For <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. Yes. I was just thinking of, uh, um, you know, this kind of apparent paradox of, of when we need to do, or when we are told to do something, some things that we, take for granted and we dedicate our time to because we decided to when they are mandatory in a way they kind of lose some sort of, of enchantment um, yeah. and and probably that's uh, that that necessarily generates uh, a gaze towards something else uh, probably um, so Jill do you want to do you want to tell us a bit more about how COVID has been impacted your um, I Yes, I think that I very much saw my home as a refuge, as a place of comfort, as a protected place. I have, over the years of my practice, conflated ideas of home and creative space. Um, the external studio I've got in Portugal was built with a lot of those things in mind and images of it featured in recent work. My space at home is more flexible, it's more around the artist researcher model because I tend to work and write and you know, make cleaner things at home or things that take longer. Um, but I think that the home has been invaded by everything else. That although I've always worked at home for a long, long time, I've had a you know, location independent working contract. I've often worked at home and from home. That notion of the protected space at home has altered. And I think that was very unsettling in the first few weeks and that the boundaries of home stopped somewhere near the front door, whereas I feel that home is within my community and the shops I visit regularly and the people I see and the places I go. So I had an extended view of home, which was sort of brought back short. On top of that, the home seems to be the only place where um, the home, garden, parks, nature, but the home is the only place with tactile haptic experience in it. I, this is deeply, I'm deeply distrustful of the experience that we're having now of the atomized kind of Zoom um, and team experiences. If you know people or you know the objects or you know the place, then you bring knowledge, memory, and other senses to bear on it if they're unusual or you don't know them you take at face value what you see on the screen and so I found myself you know really yearning to um to to have more physical contact to see actual artworks I really miss being able to go to the gallery I'd planned to go to Compton Verney next week when it opens is really irritated I now can't go out of Leicester and so I've been making more and some of the work that I just started is rather more um, it's not three dimensional, but it's like a deep relief work. And I had thought I'd use this period to draw through, but actually I'm, I'm making a lot. And you know, just that pleasure in fabric and colour and surface and touch is really important. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Anthony, do you want to chip in? In some ways, uh, 
when John remarks uh, something along the lines of, of a feeling of a sense of futility uh, in this moment, uh, I kind of relate to that. And when, when the lockdown first began, I, I um, well, actually, I, I sort of put myself in lockdown before the lockdown officially began because I became unwell with symptoms, having been working in Belfast uh, in preparation for a show that was due to open in early April. So I. I kind of, um, I went home, um, which is on the border of Suffolk and Essex, where my partner live, and our studio is in London. So I was in this sort of space, which um, when Jill was speaking there about the idea of home being a refuge, a, a kind of haptic experience of comfort, um, I was really relating to that. And I just sort of enveloped myself there and, and began to, as I sort of began to come through that, began to sort of realise that my practice was kind of um, uh, necessarily stalled uh, and the kind of practical um, mechanisms that I have in place in my sort of pre-COVID everyday life uh, were, were kind of um, unavailable to me. Um, so for instance, by, you know, just the very being able to be in my studio but even then when I do work in the studio very often if I'm working on a piece of writing or a piece of research and I'm finding it tricky to focus I'll take myself to a local cafe or I'll go and, and use a, a local community photography center um, or work there or uh, I spend a lot of time traveling on trains around the country both to attend to my academic responsibilities at work at Coventry University, but also to work in the locations where I work with other people. So with all that stuff kind of um, no longer there in place, it, it was really, really challenging. And um, and I was pretty depressed, actually, um, and didn't really quite know how to see myself through that because I'm I'm very sort of used to being very productive and, and spinning lots of plates and being in lots of places and just getting stuff done. So that sort of moment of stopping and just focusing on learning new kitchen skills or, you know, the days revolving around the five o'clock press briefings uh, felt necessary, but also after a while felt um, really kind of debilitating. Um, and so when when I received an invitation in, in May to uh, create some new work for um, a, a report written by a social affairs correspondent for the Financial Times, Robert Wright, around uh, homelessness at the time of COVID-19. It felt like a really uh, important jolt for me in, in the sense that I had to just pull that stuff aside, get myself some PPE and take myself into the centre of London and begin working with people experiencing homelessness and the local kind of grassroots organisations providing services. And that that was such a, a good thing in a sense, it kind of shot me back into to work mode. Um, and, uh, and, and, and here I am now just sort of trying to um, just keep keep things moving uh, and and also um, kind of you know another thing I suppose was over the last year and a half I I'd been working in uh, a centre for people experiencing homelessness in Birmingham called Cipher Fireside um, and uh, I spent as I often do with these sorts of projects I spent a very long period of time working in the kitchens volunteering on the floor getting to know both the staff and the people associated with the services in the centre. And, uh, and I just a few months before the lockdown had begun to shift gear on that project and began working with people, encouraging them to take cameras away and uh, to document their experiences. And, and of course, with the lockdown, Cypher Fireside had to really reinvent its services, um, had to close the centre. All of the people they work with had to be um, kind of, uh, they had to kind of access them through telephone and other, through other sort of uh, physically distant means. And so whilst the the services of Cypher sort of uh, re-stabilized. I then came back in and, and began to work with participants um, by the telephone uh, through post, mailing things to them, occasionally emailing, uh, and also sometimes through uh, uh, kind of communicative platforms like this one. So um, yeah, it's it, it's it's been a sort of strange, discombobulating time, really. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Anthony. I, I do share a lot of, um, I think, 
uh, of the things we you, you mentioned, all of you, in, in different ways, I guess. Um, I think I think my case is is uh, in somehow uh, somehow particular because it comes to the lockdown started um, shortly after I joined Coventry University, as you know, and and so my near past, so say last three years were incredibly busy, but it, but extremely, as we all know, being practitioners, the cultural sector has a, a very, very fast speed and incredibly the pace is, is the one where you are always behind, no matter how much you work. So, so that was the, a long journey as being the, the director for the, for the public programs and research at Nottingham Contemporary before I, I joined Coventry University. University. And and so I was um, I was um, directing the the research strategy for the contemporary and and also with two other universities here in in Nottingham Nottingham Trent University and the University of Nottingham and that was incredible journey was really thinking about how do we think of research in the cultural institution from the cultural institution perspective and and so so it was. Um, a very interesting journey of setting up, I think, the foundations of how we could not import the research methods from the universities to the cultural sector, but very much thinking, how do we, how are we already, this is Emily Pringle, the director for research at Tate, uh, this is her, her claim, how in the cultural sector, cultural practitioners are already deploying research methods anyway, on one hand, so identifying them with colleagues, etc., but also on the other hand, developing a program that was able to think of what are those methods, what are those epistemologies that artists and curator, curators are already developing and putting in place that are informed by research. So how do we, how do we bring them to the institution and how do we develop uh, long-term inquiries really, like instead of uh, yet another new fashionable thing, how do we set up a different pace within the cultural institution as well in thinking um, of long-term, let's say, research strands. Uh, so it was it was very uh, busy and very vivid and very, I mean, exciting, definitely. But shortly after I joined, um, and I was also finishing a book, finishing a book that, that came out literally the week uh, of the lockdown. So the, the book arrived in Nottingham the week of the 23rd of March. This is when the Prime Minister announces the lockdown on um, here. The, well, that, that became the daily uh, briefs. Um, so this is exactly the same week. So I was until last week without even seeing the book because they were stuck at Nottingham Contemporary because the building was closed for the staff and audience. So it was a bit like as if the book very much reflects, important to say, reflects all the work I've done at Nottingham Contemporary. And so um, it was a bit like as if that the output of all that work was, was kind of stuck and I didn't have access to that. And, and necessarily the reaction was, well, actually not necessarily, but the reaction was, okay, so I can leave that for now behind my back and I can think of something else. Because there's always the moment after one delving into something for a long period of time, the moment when one feels like one wants to look at something else. So kind of this shift of gaze, I guess, and having the opportunity to say, oh, that other project, that other topic that I really wanted to have time to know a bit more and delving to. So the lockdown became a bit that moment when I, Yes, like everything slowed down, as John was saying, and because of that, although we were incredibly busy in all the Zoom and, and Teams meetings, etc., I'm not saying it was at all easy to adapt, uh, actually the opposite, but at the same time, I, I, I saw a window of time kind of generating out of that condition of being at home and and so what I've done was a lot of readings really so I've been kind of reading a lot of material that were sitting on my shelves waiting for that time to come so so that was very much me and that's where I'm still I'm still there in a way so I'm surrounded can't see but I'm surrounding by papers and books and things um but but essentially I think that's how uh, I, I kind of responded and in a way kind of fit quite well uh, what I was, uh, uh, what I needed, I, I believe. Um, 
OK, so we are coming to to a close, unfortunately, and it's been very, very uh, interesting to listen to your thoughts and and how you see all these changes uh, taking place and, and I think affecting your practice. I guess probably for us to uh, finish on, I would say I, I wanted to say positive note, but I'm not sure exactly how you are going to address this question. So uh, let's leave it um, um, probably let me just pose the question and see what you have to say but I guess if we, if we can set ourselves in the future in the near future um, when when these restrictions are over uh, and eventually we have a vaccine and and eventually uh, we go back to some sort of normality what do you think is, is going to be your takeaway from this situation John I think that's a, that's a big, it's a good question and it's quite a, a complex one. And part of me, one of the things I've been thinking about in this recent time is the idea of technical innovation in art and the fact that it's, you know, it is a mainstay of modernism, one, one might say. Um, but the more I think about it, the more I think it is for me a sort of red herring in some way. And that's, um, one, of the, one of the great things and also the most depressing things about the internet is that you can see brilliant artists uh, working all over the world and, and you look how old they are, they're about 20 or 25, you know, so there are people, I think, producing, I, I guess in the same way Jill was saying, I, would, I miss going into a gallery and looking at stuff, to be frank, but I've tended to look more online at stuff happening through the internet, Instagram. And it's a kind of bewildering and bombarding in a sense. And maybe part of me wants to get away from that. And hence, I think that's why I'm looking more at things as primary source material, let's say. Whereas for many years, I've worked with mediated images, um, say film and photography, a sort of mainstay of what I'm interested in. And I found myself looking back at the um, primary source material. Now, whether that will stay, I'm not sure, but it's 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 part and parcel of perhaps this slightly slowing down is perhaps the wrong way of putting it because it's not. But it's to do with reflecting, I guess, and um, I think I might move more towards a sort of primary source material model of practice, but I'm not sure it's it's, you know, like Anthony, I think I was pretty well. Um, unnerved by it in some ways I must admit in the first few weeks it did unnerve me and, and in a household with an elderly person and a very young person and all the sort of things, uncertainty. Um, it's very strange, you know, so it's, but I think I might come out of it with, with a slightly, uh, slightly different focus, let's say. Thank you. Is that okay? Yes, great, thank you. <laughs> um, Jill, Anthony, who wants to come next? Jill? I'm yeah. muted, yes. Um, I think it's making me reflect on art in the home, made in the home, for the home, of the home, really. And that long standing interest of, about around the home that I have um, and the domestic. And I, I suspect we won't go back completely to normal. So they'll, but we also won't be where we are now. I wonder if that will trigger more of the haptic and the actual existing in the home. Um, if that'll be the place for it. It certainly is for me and it's valuable in that sense. Um, but I think it's making me reflect on the home because having felt that there was a home with a refuge, with a creative, albeit portable space, psychologically uh, in terms of, of, of a space of making, the ho I found lockdown to be a form of drudgery um, in terms of cleaning and cooking and shopping. It's been monotonous, repetitive and time consuming. And that's coexisted with my delight in the comfort and home of my garden and you know the sense of a secure place so it's challenged notions of comfort in the home I haven't found it a pleasant retreat to home particularly so it will for me I think you know can just bring up a reconsideration of home studio work and the interrelationship between the three really thank you thank you Jill Anthony I think one of the 
one of the things that I, I think a lot about, actually, um, is how the experiences of this pandemic moment are so different and vastly different for different people. And particularly those people who were kind of um, already on the margins, this, this, this sort of uh, necessary physical social distancing has thrown them even further into a deep isolation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and whether that be someone who is shielding because they're older or have, you know, conditions, health conditions, or whether that's because someone is in a bit in abuse, an abusive relationship or in a relationship that's not working, or whether that's someone who's who's living on the street. And I and I I can't help but think about how this moment has taught us that real structural changes to society are possible, given the political will um, and the political choice, and how. Some of these changes, you know, the kind of uh, temporary uh, emergency investment in the NHS or the temporary um, kind of shelter provided to people experiencing homelessness may not be the solutions to the greater problems of our society, but are actually kind of a demonstration that real change is possible when there is a will. And and I I can't help but think that this this is a moment to push a locked door open and uh to 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 you know maybe not only on the individual level we can all kind of rethink our priorities about how we interact with other people uh in our everyday lives or uh in our own homes but also um more broadly socially politically i I would hope that Mm -hmm. that this this moment uh may kind of uh, lead to some greater changes. Um, mm-hmm. I keep thinking about stuff like that, which is all rather kind of big, I realize, but, mm-hmm. um, but that's kind of what I'm thinking about. Oh, that, that's, that's incredible. I, I think what you were saying is, is really reminded me of, um, I probably don't have such a kind of a, an optimistic, um, message uh, and and vision probably but I do feel like one of the things that really struck me during the lockdown was precisely what you were saying how will um, really uh, is able to implement um, uh, a, a lot of changes but quite quickly so we had these sat- uh, satellite images for instance being shared all over um, you know uh, new the news and and social media eventually I'm not on social media but imagine where we could see how the the environment how um, the, the you know people being at home factories closed uh, airplanes stopped etc immediately in two three weeks changed the quality of uh, our air so so how these things kind of have an impact immediate impact i thought you know in my ignorance that things would take some good time you know we're talking about like eventually years but just to see those immediate um impacts and how things were possible precisely you know as you were saying it's possible it's possible to create shelters it's possible to uh to um you know stop flying all of a sudden to stop trains cars etc so there was something about this possibility of a change uh, and, and because I was saying I'm not as optimistic is because I see now that we are three months in that initial uh, reaction, uh, that things are going back exactly to or trying to go ex- back exactly to where we were, where we stopped in a way, where we paused the machine. And this anxiety to go back to that inv- instead of taking the opportunity um, that we had, because we, we had the opportunity to also test a lot of mechanisms. Uh, and we know in universities test, for instance, online learning and teaching and, you know, a lot of things. But but also in terms of how we can ep- could implement uh, environmental change. And, um, and we, unfortunately, I think what we are going to see is uh, the very quick uh, implementation of things that we were not looking forward to, such as lo- surveillance systems, such as borders being even more uh, closed, um, and and so on and so forth, and those things that were probably a good opportunity to to reflect on and to implement. I think they will be probably uh, forgotten or uh, intentionally intentionally forgotten, um, but. Um, but anyway, um, I think it's very, very good reflections and definitely we want um, 
um, go out of the situation uh, the same. There will be a lot of a lot of changes, definitely. And um, I look forward to seeing you in blood and flesh, obviously, and uh, and to uh, be able to continue our work together uh, at Coventry, uh, but also to continue, you know, for the time being, if we cannot see each other in person, to continue these conversations, hopefully also online. So thank you so much for your time and your thoughts. And um, and uh, yes, we'll we'll keep in touch.